Fathers, hello everyone and welcome. This week we have part two in our series that we started last week. This one's entitled Team Jesus by Bruxy Cavey. So as always, kick back and relax and let's see what the Spirit might have to teach us this week. Our focus today is the doctrine of union with Christ. Christ is not outside us, but dwells within us. Not only does he cleave to us by an indivisible bond of fellowship, but with a wonderful communion. John Calvin, 1509-1564 Day by day he grows more and more into one body with us, until he becomes completely one with us. John Calvin The theme of our union with Christ was a favorite of the Apostle Paul. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? The Apostle Paul. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live in a new life. The Apostle Paul. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. The Apostle Paul Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. The Apostle Paul For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus. Friends, I can't tell you how excited I am for today's message. I can tell you actually, watch this. I'm very excited. There, I told you. I'm very excited. This whole series has the potential, I think, to make significant changes in how we think, how we feel, our attitudes and our actions and our relationships with others and with the world around us. And that then has an, uh, the implication of changing our environment, changing our relationships and having a wider impact in the world. And it all starts with what's going on in our heads, our, the way we think. And we're, we're using this series to dive into some deep, rich theology and scripture, but we're also making it hopefully exceedingly practical. Uh, we said last week that we're going to be talking about um, a, a constellation of doctrines. These four teachings in Scripture are the ones that are going to come to the fore throughout the series. The Trinity, perichoresis, union with Christ, theosis. The Trinity, God's internal relationality. Perichoresis, the fact that the members of the Trinity interpenetrate one another. To get to know one of them is to get to know all of them. Union with Christ, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. A theosis is our participation in union with the love life of God. If we are in Christ and Christ is in the Trinity, then we are invited into the fullness of who God is. Let's start with a question. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus right now? Where is he? Point. Point. Where? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of this. I'm seeing some of this. See some exercising going on. I'm, some are pointing up and you're all right, which is fascinating because the Bible speaks of Jesus being in us, Jesus being with us. But we're also told that Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So how is he there and here? And that's through the Holy Spirit. There's perichoresis, right? That through, through, as we have the Holy Spirit in us, we're actually getting to know the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ. So, so Jesus is technically where in heaven but through the spirit he's present here with us and in us as well let me ask you another question where are you point 
<laughs> well, right here, some of you go, oh, that's trippy, man. I don't know. Well, <laughs> as you're working off your hangover, let me tell you, you're at the meeting house. And uh, we're glad your friends dragged you out to church. Wonderful. We're glad you're here. Where are you? Well, here, the reverse. Technically, I am here. But spiritually, I am in heaven with Christ. That's how close the union with Christ is, which is going to be our focus for today, today's message. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6, he says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So Christ entered our humanity. He returned to heaven, but through his spirit is still here. We have entered into Christ. We're technically here, but through the spirit, we're there. We have begun our eternal life in the heart of God. And so there's some profound aha moments. I know for me, just in studying this and returning to this topic and reflecting on it, and hopefully some very practical applications. That's where we're headed today. I want you to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter five. That's where we're gonna head to, Romans chapter five. Now across all of our sites, we do have visitor Bibles. If you don't have your own Bible with you, you can um, either flag down an usher if they're handing them out, or there may be tables where you can go and get a visitor Bible. But I want you to all have a copy of the Bible and follow along or share with someone close to you and make sure I'm not making this stuff up. This is what is in the Bible, Romans chapter five, starting with verse 12. That's where we're headed, Romans chapter five, verse 12. While you're looking up Romans chapter five, I'll just mention this. Because we are spending time every Sunday through this series with some very uh, practical practices, some spiritual exercises, uh, it's going to cut into our Q&A time, as we learned last week, and um, I think that's all right for this series. If you're new at the Meeting House, we very much value Q&A, a dialogue, and that happens a little bit on Sunday morning, certainly happens through home church during the week where we get a chance to discuss the message and share what we're learning and ask questions together. Um, but for this series, we're going to have to shift that. I don't think we'll have time for Q&A, but uh, we value it enough to reserve an entire Sunday just for Q&A. So there's going to be four weeks of teaching. We've had one, and that was on the spiritual discipline of welcome. And then today we're going to talk about meditation. And then the next two weeks we'll talk about prayer, different forms of prayer. And then the fifth week will be just all Q&A. So we would love for you to send in your questions. And across all of our sites, this gives you all an opportunity to send in questions. And if possible, it'd be great if you could not just type in your question in the email or tweet it, but to, to post a video and, and link it. So it, you can send an email to askthemeetinghouse.com or you can tweet at the meeting house and use the hashtag TMHask. Um, and if you do, if you make a video, include your name and your site. If you can keep it under 30 seconds, great. If you can keep it closer to 10 seconds, fantastic. Just hi, my name is, I attend this site, and my question is, and we love to use as many video questions as possible, but you can send in a question any way that you want. It'd be great to hear from you, and we will save those up for the last Sunday of the series. All right, we're going to dive into Romans chapter 5. By the way, I mentioned last week was the spiritual discipline of welcome. How'd you deal with that throughout the week? How'd you do? Some of you are like, yes, it was great. It was a game changer. And others are going, oh, stink. Right. We had like homework. We were supposed to actually do something. I wasn't just compartmentalizing my spirituality. So I went for an hour on a Sunday and then could forget about God for the rest of the week. Stink. And so remember, I understand this is... Uh, this is a challenge for many of us to actually live this out, but we want to give ourselves the tools and the challenge to invest in spiritual practices that make a difference in our life. And, and so for this series, we want to give you something every Sunday and we'll begin to practice it here, but then you need to take it with you. So this week's spiritual practice of welcome, I've talked to some of you, made a significant difference. Others are saying completely forgot. I get it. But it's a new week. We can push the reset button and we can begin today to commit to that. And we'll talk more about that as we move forward. All right, you've got your Bibles open to Romans chapter 5. We'll start at verse 12. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, dot, 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 and then, I don't know if you noticed this, but Paul loses his train of thought here. He never completes the sentence. He actually has just distracted him with the profundity of his own theology. <laughs> he just said, De now, because sin has entered the world through one man and death through sin, 
in this way, we all sin. Because, and, that, and then he never says, well, because this, therefore that. He just now says, well, hold on a second. This is an amazing thought. Let me explain this further. And he continues with this. I like the fact that Paul, we think, yeah, sometimes you read something and say, well, the, 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 the grammatical structure of Scripture is unusual. This is, and sometimes it's just actually the very humanity of the person that God is using just spilling out on paper, and we get a chance. He didn't have word processors. He didn't have an opportunity to delete and change. It's like he's most likely dictating to an amanuensis who is a scribe who, who takes dictation, and once you've said it and it's in print, it's staying. So you actually get to see the unfolding of how God is working with a person through some of the letters of the Apostle Paul, and I love it. But in this thought that then captures him, he says something really fascinating. Sin came through one man. Death then came through that sin and passed on to all people because in the end, all sinned. This is what we call corporate solidarity. Corporate solidarity is the first step of the doctrine of union with Christ, which we are focusing on today. Corporate solidarity is the idea that we are together part of something that is shared, and there is often a single representative of the group who makes decisions on our behalf. Corporate solidarity happens all the time. A president or prime minister, a king or a queen can decide that a nation is going to war, and then the nation is going to war. There are all kinds of decisions that politicians make on our behalf, and then it becomes our reality, our truth. And in fact, it is how humans live together in corporate solidarity. It's not always fair, but it makes togetherness possible. Of course, when we first read this, that Adam was like our federal head, the leader of the human race. And by the way, when the New Testament talks about Adam, it usually means Adam and Eve, and use Adam as a short form for Adam and Eve. I think primarily because it's gonna make the comparison with Jesus as the second Adam. So it, be, it becomes um, handy to speak of Adam and then the second Adam being Jesus. When Adam sinned, it affects all of us. We say that's not fair. Now Paul, Paul goes on to say, yes, but you all sin too. It's not as though you would have done a better job if you were in his place, but it's true. We are reaping the consequences that our head, our federal head made um, we're reaping the consequences of his decision, this corporate solidarity. It seems unfair, I get it. Like that time in school when the teacher kept you in from recess because one student did something stupid. I remember that time. I don't know if you do. I remember that time when uh, the teacher had left the class for a few minutes and uh, she had a yardstick she'd often use to point, and she, she put that down against her desk, and some of the students were walking around. I guess one just kind of stepped on the stick, and it snapped, and she came back in from being outside of the class, and she saw her pointer, her yardstick was broken, and she said, who, who broke this? And it was dead silence. I'm looking around, people looking around, it's just dead silence. We're all sitting there looking like we were so righteous. He said, listen, someone needs to confess. Recess is about to start, and until someone lets me know who did this, you're not heading out to recess, none of you, not, not the whole class. I thought, this is a travesty. <laughs> this is injustice to the hilt. And then finally the bell went, it's recess time, and we are still sitting there, and no one is fessing up, and I am thinking someone, confess, anybody, confess before recess is over. But I knew, I knew deep down inside that no one was going to confess to breaking the teacher's stick. I knew that because I had broken the teacher's stick. <laughs> I was that kid. And I wanted company. You know, so I gotta stay in, might as well stay with me. All right, so corporate solidarity, very unfair. The Apostle Paul says, though, you would have done the same thing if you were in Adam's place. You sin all the time. And so we think, yes, this is such a tragedy. I don't like this idea that because Adam sinned, the whole human race is plunged into it. But hold on a second. Corporate solidarity also makes the best thing, not just the worst thing, but the best thing in the world possible. Corporate solidarity is really good news because of this. Corporate solidarity says that, because, well, yes, because of Adam's sin, his sin becomes our sin, yes, but also because of corporate solidarity, Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness. The new Adam, the decisions he makes apply to us in such a beautiful way. So as we read on, let's jump down to verse 18. 
Romans 5.18, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Corporate solidarity is a beautiful thing. We are born in Adam. He's our head, the head of the human race. But we have an opportunity to be reborn in Christ. With Christ as the head of this new race, this new humanity. And his choices reverse what Adam has done. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul echoes this in a similar way. He says, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is really good news. But wait, there's more. Sound like I'm peddling Popeil's pocket fisherman. And... All God's people under 40 went, huh? Anyway, in the incarnation, Jesus did not just assume a position as our federal head. He fused himself with humanity, with humankind, not ceasing to be God, but he becomes a man. He fuses himself with us. And so in the life of Christ is the reunion of what was separated. God and humankind are brought together in his one life. And as he enters our humanity, he pulls us and our humanity into his life. And he starts to make different decisions. And when you see this theological backdrop to the intention of Jesus, the life of Jesus, you begin to see things in his life that changes everything. I mean, simple things. What was the first thing that Jesus did when he started his public career? When he started his public messianic career, what was the first thing he did to establish who he was? Do you remember? Matthew chapter three. He walks up to his cousin, who is John the Baptist, and he says, what? Baptize me. And John, how does John react? He's confused. John the Baptist, because he was preaching a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. If you have... If you want God to forgive you of your sins, come get baptized right here, right now. And Jesus comes and says, I'll have one of those. And John's confused. He says, no, you, no, 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 no. You don't need a baptism for repentance for forgiveness of sins. I should be baptized by you, not you baptized by me. And all Jesus says is we need to do this so all righteousness will be fulfilled. So that all rightness, it would be right for us to do this. He doesn't fully explain why. But you see, Jesus is now not only incarnated as a baby into our humanity, but as an adult. He's making the choices that identify himself intentionally with our human frailty and failure. And Jesus says... I am stepping fully into your human experience to bring you fully into my experience. I am the bridge out of Adam and into God's love life through Christ. So he is baptized in a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins as the full human who is taking us into himself. So his experience becomes our experience. And then what does he do next? As soon as he's done being baptized and the voice of the father says he's well pleased with him and, and the spirit comes and descends on him as a dove, what's the very next thing that Jesus does? Now Matthew chapter four, he is led by the spirit where? Into the wilderness. Where, what happens? Who does he meet there? Satan, the serpent. Now we're in a wilderness, not in the garden. Because the fall has happened, everything's gone awry. It's the contrast, not a garden, but the wilderness, but the same serpent in both. And what is he doing? Tempting. And what's his first temptation? It's about food. It's not fruit from a luscious tree. This is no garden, it's a wilderness. He's got no food, it's about a rock. Turn that rock into bread. Get yourself something to eat. And this is the reboot of humanity. But in Christ, a different choice is made. Jesus says no to the temptation on our behalf, taking us with him. In fact, he says no and he says, he quotes 
Deuteronomy 8, 3, when he says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man, man. He could have said, it is written, as he does later, don't tempt the Lord your God. He could have started with that, which is true about him. He could have said, how dare thee tempt thine master? It's always better when you use a King James. It, but he says, no, man, I'm not only God, I am man, and I identify with the new humanity. Man shall not live. In fact, in Deuteronomy, where he's quoting, the word man there is Adam. Adam will make a different choice this time around. In your notes, you have a number of Bible passages because this is all splashed through the teaching of both Jesus and Paul. Uh, union with Christ because it's not just about Jesus being our representative. We are unified with him and then that gets expressed in both Christ being in us and us being in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 15. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? He's not just speaking as an analogy. He's saying your bodies are actually part of who Jesus is with him being the head there is a oneness there. You are unified with him, union with Christ. That gets expressed by Christ in us and us in Christ. First Christ in us, Colossians 1, 27. Paul says, this is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery, but it's true. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ, says the Apostle Paul, speaking personally. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We're gonna make this our theme verse for meditation in a few minutes. Galatians 4, 19. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. There's the goal of discipleship. I'm going through pains. Like I'm giving birth to something in you as I labor with you. We do this together. We, we, we work in partnership with one another and with what the Holy Spirit is doing with the goal, the formation of Christ in us that we make room for him. Romans 8 is a fascinating passage. It kind of answers this, the question, who's in us? Christ? Romans 8, uh, verses 9 to 11. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. Ah, that's who's in us. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, what is it, the spirit of God or the spirit of Christ? Yes. That's perichoresis. To have one is to have the fullness of the Trinity. Well, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, oh, he's gone from the Spirit of God to the Spirit of Christ, it's just saying Christ. If Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, there's the Father. You have the Spirit, the Son, the Father. Well, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his spirit lives in you and he comes full circle. We have the full triune love life of God dwelling inside. But wait, there's more. Not only Jesus in us, but us in Christ. And this is a fascinating union. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. We are now participating in Adam 2.0, the new humanity. Ephesians 2.6, we read earlier, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We are as good as already engaged in our eternal life. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. It has practical implications. That's actually where our life is. So we set our hearts on things above. That doesn't mean that we're so heavenly minded we're no earthly good. We ignore the world around us and basic concerns because, hey, it's just me and Jesus hanging out. Because the things above, setting our hearts on the things of Christ, well, what is God thinking about? What is God caring about? What is, he cares about people. He cares about those who are made in his image. He cares about how we treat and love one another. 
So I set my minds on things above, not in contrast to caring about people, it's just me and God, but actually God teaches me how to care about people more. I, I'm not focused on the things of this world as in the distractions of materialism, uh, entertainment, things that can often just be such a time sucker. It doesn't mean having a something or being entertained by something is sin, but it does mean that there is a pattern that our culture calls us into that can be such a time sucker that we, we just do not live lives of love. We don't live particularly bad lives. We just invest all our time in, well, we go to work because we have to, but other than that, we just self-medicate with distraction. And it might be shopping. It might be, it might be Netflix. It might be video games. It, it, could, it could be reading. I mean, if there's, there's wonderful pursuits, but in the end, are we investing in the lives of other people around us? So here's a summary. What have we been looking at so far? In scripture, we've walked through a bunch of scriptures. Just a quick summary and a review. Union with Christ begins with our corporate solidarity. Second, Jesus conquered sin and death as our representative. As in Adam was our representative, Jesus is ours. And he conquered it on our behalf. But we continue. More than that, through the incarnation, Jesus fused deity and humanity together in his being so that Jesus not only accomplished things for us, but as us. Jesus took us into himself so that we died with him and rose with him. If we keep reading in Romans, I don't know if you have your Bible still open to Romans 5, if we move on to chapter 6, it says, should we keep sinning so the grace may increase? Chapter 6, verse 2, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer? Or don't you know, he says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him, Romans 6, 5, in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a res resurrection like his. And he goes on to talk about the old self dying, etc. So you see, he didn't just accomplish things for us. They stand back and watch. I'll do this for you as your representative. Corporate solidarity, beautiful. But because of union with Christ, he did them as us. He took us with him. And he has taken us, in a sense, to heaven now where we are seated in the heavenlies. As we move forward, now we don't just benefit from the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, we participate in it. We don't just benefit from, we participate in. And Jesus and Paul and other New Testament writers uses pictures to help drive this home like husband and wife, the head and the body, the vine and the branches. This is how intimate we are. All right, let's take a look at our takeout. How are we going to apply this? The Apostle Paul said, we've touched on this verse earlier. In Galatians. <clears throat> Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Beautiful. We are seeing the Apostle Paul, even as he's writing to the Galatians, teaching the magnificent, profound theological truth. He's caught up in the personal nature of this truth. Starting then here at the end, he's talking about the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for for me, not just for humanity in general, which is true, not just for us corporately, which is true, but it comes right down to him being able to say me. He died for me. When I was growing up in church, I often heard the pastor say, if there was only one of you, if there was only you, Jesus would have still come and he still would have lived and he still would have died and risen again just for you. God loves you that much. And he's right. For me. God loves me. <laughs> Let's take it out of the conceptual. Make it personal. Paul does this for us. Working backwards, or, or let's start at the beginning. 
I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. At first read, that sounds as though we have been fully absorbed into Christ so that we disappear, that the I, the I disappears. I here is ego in Greek, ego, lego my ego. It is, um, again, under 40, huh? Uh, it is, or ego, as we would say in English. Uh, I, my ego has been crucified with Christ and I, ego, no longer live. Christ lives in me. So I guess I'm just a vessel taken over by Jesus. I have no ego. I have no self left. Sounds like that. But no, this is not the Borg from Star Trek. This is something more because let's keep reading. There's an I, an ego that has been crucified. There's an I that no longer lives. But look, the life I, ego, now live in the body. I, ego, live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is an I who does not live, but there is an I who lives still in connection with the Son of God. There is an old I, an old ego, that lived as a single will, asserting myself in the world. That ego dies, and there is a new I, a new ego, that is a partnered will that lives in communion with Christ. And that is true whenever we move into relationship. Relationship is about wills partnering, sometimes in small amounts, sometimes large amounts. You can live as a single person. You have a singular will. You get to decide when you get up in the morning, when you go to sleep. And maybe work dictates when you have to get up. You decide how late you're going to stay out. You decide what you're going to have for breakfast, what you're going to eat, where you're going to go. You decide what you're going to do in the evening when you have free time. You're making those decisions. There may be times when your will partners with others for a brief amount of time. You meet with your friends that evening. Hey, guys, you get together. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Ah, now my will is partnering with others. I don't erase myself, but I participate in corporate solidarity with my friends for a while. Hey, let's go here. Let's have this. Now I still come back to individual will. I will order this off the menu, but we decide together where we're going to eat and what movie are we going to see and how... Then I go back home and then it's singular ego again. And I, we have these brief times of blending our will. But you know, all relationship, if it's to be done well, is the blending of wills rather than one person asserting his or her will. If you are that person who says, I have to make my own decisions, it's always about me, then we have a name for you. It's called lonely. You will not have friends. You must know that all relationship, meaningful relationship, is a submission of will into blended will where you do not disappear completely, but you are partnered with others. And that's a beautiful way to be human. That's how we're designed to live. When you choose to be a parent, your will is bent toward a new life. There is a I, an ego that dies, but there is a new I that comes to life. When you get married, that brief time of relationship you have with friends, now that comes into all aspects of your life. Now you don't decide necessarily when you get up and when you go to sleep and what you're going to eat and what you're going to do with your food. You don't even get to decide what position you're going to sleep in in bed at night. You're like, hey, let's go your way. No, no, let's go your way. I was already this way. Well, I want to go your way. All right, well, let's cuddle. No, no, I'm sweaty. Let's go. All right, well, let's go over. <laughs> Everything is partnered and blended. And sometimes it can be a hassle, but when it is beautiful and mutually submissive. When there's love flowing back and forth, it's a beautiful way to live. This is the marriage with Jesus, where your will is a blended will with his. In the life you now live, in the body, in space, as you make decisions, you make with him together. I wanna give us the tools to begin to live this way this week. This is a way of tuning into reality, not escaping it. This is the reality that we live in. We can suppress it. We can live like it doesn't exist. We can find our satisfaction in all kinds of different things, but it's temporary and we always live seemingly in the need of more. There is a kind of satisfaction in Christ that can lead to a contentment in this world that is beautiful. Let's take steps in that direction this week. Here's your, your exercise, your spiritual exercise for the week. Memorization and meditation. I say memorization. We're going to meditate on scripture, but then if we can at least memorize the basic gist of the passage, we can take that meditation with us into the rest of our day, even when our Bibles aren't open. Here are some points. I would like to invite us to commit to reading and repeating Galatians 2.20, the passage we've just read. Every day this week, first thing when we wake up, last thing before going to bed, at least that much. Have your Bible or write it out. Keep it by your bed. Read it as you go to bed and when you wake up first thing. 
and see how that develops throughout the week. Secondly, find one 10 to 15 minute period during each day to meditate on it. We'll talk about the specific things to meditate on, but first of all, find that 10 to 15 minute period every day. For some of you, you can do more, but try not to do less. Biblical meditation tends to focus on truth and to wash the mind in truth. There's other forms of meditation that are about emptying, letting it all go. Biblical meditation empties the negative through displacement by flooding the mind with truth, washing the mind with truth. So, so take time to flood your mind with the realities of Galatians 2.20 and meditate on A, the reality of Christ living in you, B, the I who no longer lives and the I who now lives. There is a version of me that lives for self that is crucified with Christ. But there is a me who lives in partnership and faith, faith in the Son of God, trusting relationship with that is alive. And I want to get to know this new I. C, the love of Jesus who gave himself for you, for me. Read that and own it. Join in with the Apostle Paul. Love me, he gave himself for me. Let it sink in. Next, three, let yourself become aware of what the I wants to do, who the true I wants to be, how the true I wants to live, the true I, the you. And here's the hint, to recognize the true you instead of the old you or the false you. The true I is not the I who is caught up in the desires for more and the distractions of worry, anxiety, or the pursuit of personal gain. The true I is content and also delights in, finds joy in, and loves all people. Everyone is a precious image bearer of God. These are the things of heaven. This is what, God, this is what heaven's thinking about right now. And that I, recognize it. Oh, there I go. That's me. That thought, that's me, that's me. The thought that's like, eh, I just want to go, that's not me anymore. Lean in to who you truly are. So we're going to close by just taking 30 seconds to actually be, do our first practice. What you'll do for 10 or 15 minutes, let's do it now. I would love across all our sites to invite you to stand up with me. Stand up with me. We'll just change our posture so we can more easily refocus our mind. In a moment, we'll put the passage up on the screen <clears throat> and we'll read it through out loud. I encourage you at least, at least once to read it through out loud, if not over and over again when you meditate. It's good for you to hear your own voice affirm back to your own ears that God really does love you, that God loves me. Hear your voice saying this and declaring it as true. Let your physicality, including your voice and then your hearing, reinforce truth to your spirit. So we'll read this through out loud together, and then we're just gonna take 30 seconds before I close in prayer to meditate on this truth, to just dip our toes in the water of what we're going to do this week. Let's read together. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's meditate on this. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so profoundly. Jesus, thank you for taking us into yourself, for, for fusing with our humanity, for becoming flesh, and allowing us then 
through your death, burial, and resurrection to die to our old self, be buried and rise again to a new life. Thank you for taking us to heaven with you. Thank you for holding us close to your heart. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you bring Jesus into our hearts. And I pray that this week you will continue to be our teacher, bring to mind, to our conscious awareness, the reality of just how intimately we are invited into the love life of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. For those of you who don't know Jesus, I hope you get to know him and get born again and get filled with the Holy Spirit. And for those of us who do, I hope you realize how you've been crucified with Christ, that you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. And the life which you now live in this flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God, who loved you and gave everything for you. Don't forget to pray for the children or fellow brothers and sisters around the world and those lost in the darkness so they too could see the light. May our Father bless you. May he keep you. May his grace shine upon you. Give you peace. I'll see you next time.